Here is a simple little secret the evolutionist doesn't want you to consider. The evolutionist and the creationist are both looking at the same scientific evidence and facts. So why are their conclusions so very different? What happens with both groups in reality is this. Both groups look at the same set of evidence for any given proposition. One group, the evolutionist, arrives at the conclusion that this thing that they are observing must have happened accidentally, without any intelligent input, through a random process of natural selection. We don't want to believe that God exists from the beginning, they would say. So regardless of what evidence is before us, our conclusion must fit our presupposition. The creationist looks at the very same evidence, the very same facts and body of science, and arrives at the conclusion based upon the very same evidence that intelligence had to be behind the intricacy, complexity, information systems, communication systems, and sheer intelligence displayed within the same body of evidence. So the creation-evolution debate, then, is not really a debate over the evidence. Everyone is looking at the same evidence. It really is a debate over philosophy. That is, how does one ultimately interpret the evidence that they're looking at? Therefore, science itself doesn't really say anything. Scientists do. And how one philosophically interprets the evidence before them really is very crucially important to other conclusions that must be drawn. Let me give you an example of how this works. The evolutionist says that there is no intelligence behind creation. The driving impetus for all of life, all 20 million species of it, is natural selection. The random, non-intelligent, accidental process that produces everything we know as life. But we watch evolution philosophy fall apart when we ask some simple common sense questions. We begin with these. When then did the sexes originate? How did the sexes originate? How is it that they could have, for they would have to have, originated at the exact same time with all reproductive functions present and working in both the male and female in order for the species to continue. The sperm and the egg would need to be intact and all processes of meeting, division, and gestation would have to be in perfect working order. On top of that, how is it that every species, which is most of the 20 million species, that reproduce sexually, male and female, how is it that they arrived at the same time within their species? and with all of their parts working, and their reproductive processes in order. To further complicate the matter, the evolutionist must answer then one of the big questions. Why? Why would sexual reproduction have randomly originated through the natural selection process when it takes so much energy? There's a courting process, the copulation process, gestation, the danger of the delivery of the newborn of the species, the changing of diets during the pregnancy, etc., etc. The whole premise of natural selection is that it randomly seeks the path of least resistance, the least amount of energy expenditure, and the most beneficial processes to the species. Now, to be honest, some evolutionists have attempted to give answers to each of these questions. But regardless of their answers, here is where the philosophy of evolutionary conclusions comes into play. Now consider this. Let us say that we will agree with the evolutionist for now and say that natural selection and the random process of the survival of the fittest gave us, accidentally and randomly, the two complete functioning sexes complete with reproductive systems among humans. Why and how then did natural selection make, generally speaking, women weaker? Why did it make women smaller? Why did it make women the only child bearers? Why did it make women with a distinctive mothering and homemaking instinct? Why did it make women more emotionally connected in worldview as opposed to the male's more matter-of-fact worldview, generally speaking? So you see the result of this wonderful evolutionary natural selection process is then that men are by far dominant and women have been more abused, less powerful. They have less social standing. They make less money. They are less esteemed in many cultures of the world, etc. Evolution gave women the horrible short end of the stick, one which the vast majority of the population of women in the world have yet to overcome. Therefore, according to evolution thinking, women are necessary 
only for producing babies and can be abused, enslaved, and maligned because, after all, evolution process is just natural selection, survival of the fittest. This drives everything in evolution. Of course, no evolutionist would admit this, but this is the conclusion at which one arrives when evolution is your philosophical interpretation of the scientific evidence. Or it could be that God purposely created humans, male and female, equally glorious in creation. Man and woman were created to need each other to be complete. However, our fallen condition, our sin nature, as clearly portrayed in the Bible, has caused the warped view and treatment of women, so prevalent throughout the world. Sin has also caused the warped view towards all of humanity that falls prey to the strongest and most wicked in humanity. Therefore, the Christian knows that he must work to overcome evil by changing the hearts and minds of people through the gospel of Jesus Christ and a born-again experience in him. And how does the evolutionist work to overcome this evil of evolution? The short end of the stick that evolution gave women, for example? Well, he shouldn't have to work at it at all. Why would he? It is all a part of the unfeeling, unthinking, random, natural selection process. I choose door number two, the biblical worldview. How about you? So you can see, science in and of itself really doesn't say anything scientists do. We interpret the exact same scientific evidence before us. One starts with, there can't be a God. The other starts with, there must be a God. Again, I choose door number two.